About eight, nine years ago now, I was diagnosed with breast cancer uh, and decided, you know, in, in a, my feminist way to go out on the web and find supportive friends and, you know, information and sisterhood and all of that. What I found was very different, though. Uh, first of all, there's the pink ribbon culture, which I know you share in the UK, but perhaps not to the frenetic extreme we do which is all about trying to make breast cancer seem pretty and feminine and nice. Um, and then I kept running into these messages, you know, in so many forms, uh, exhortations to be positive about my situation and disease. You know, to be to totally cheerful about it, optimistic, to the extent of embracing the disease as if it were a good thing that happened to me. Now, that may sound strange, but um, Lance Armstrong has said that cancer was the best thing that ever happened to him, which makes you wonder about the rest of his life. But um, <laughs> this is very much, this is still very much the line that you will come out of the cancer experience, and not only breast cancer, but they say this about prostate cancer, a better person. You will become more evolved, more spiritual, etc. None of which happened to me. I'm just, you know, I'm, if anything, a little meaner uh, than I was before and um, more cynical. Uh, so, you know, this, this was disturbing um, to me. Um, I now can say with some confidence, uh, due to studies that are very recent, 07, 08, that there's nothing to uh, nothing to the idea that you are more likely to recover from cancer if you have a positive attitude, because that was the law. You know that your attitude actually um, affects your immune system. You've all heard this, I know it. It affects your immune system, and so you can fight. Uh, your body can fight disease better, and specifically cancer. Well. Um, Matthew didn't mention that PhD of mine was actually in cellular immunology. So, you know, don't mess with me about the immune system. Um, it's not, none of that is true. Um, the immune system doesn't fight cancer. It was evolved to um, fight foreign intruders, microbes. And uh, cancer, unfortunately, is her own cells run amok. And the recent studies show that attitude has no, makes no difference to uh, your uh, survival, but you know, th there I was uh, feeling, uh, as so many uh, victims of cancer uh, are made to feel, like I had two diseases. One was the cancer, and the other was my bad attitude. You know, and why, which was not going to change. I knew that. You know, I was um, going to snarl my way through the whole thing, and I did. Um, anyway, that went out of my mind. I thought this was all something very peculiar to the breast cancer culture, the pink ribbon culture that's grown up around breast cancer. But within a few years, I began to encounter the same ideology of positive thinking being applied to people who were downsized uh, from the corporate world, white collar, middle level people, uh, being sent to um, you know, support groups or networking groups, there are all kinds of names for these things, where the message was, hey, it's not bad to be laid off. It's actually a good thing. Uh, it's actually an opportunity. It's a growth opportunity. And you will come out of it much better. And if you want to come out of it at all, of course, you better work on your attitude. Because the key to getting a job in today's corporate world is not knowing things or having skills or experience, but having a positive attitude. So you have to work on that. So I said, you know, wow, this sounds very similar. And you take somebody who's in a, an absolute low point in their lives, and certainly losing a job can be that, as well as having some potentially fatal disease, and just tell them, it's nothing wrong. You know, just put, you know, put on a smiley face and get on with it. And, you know, don't complain. 
whatever you do. Uh, so then I, be, I, I began to see a pattern and find it in more and more aspects of um, American life. Uh, this kind of mandatory optimism and cheerfulness. Uh, one area where it is very strongly concentrated now and has been for some years is the corporate world, the workplace, where the idea has been, yes, indeed, you better be positive because you're not really there to do X or Y task. You're there to spread good cheer and make the other people around you comfortable and happy uh, all, all day. Um, now, you might think, what's wrong with that? I mean, certainly many people have asked me, well, all right, so it's delusional to think everything is OK, or to go to the real delusional extreme. Uh, there's, uh, you know, embedded in all this is the idea that you change the physical world with your thoughts. When you send thoughts out from your mind, they exert a force that brings things to you that you want. So if, you know, if I were, you know, we're doing this right, we could all concentrate on getting a million dollars or whatever, and indeed it would, it would come. Uh, you know, and there have been a lot of attempts to explain this scientifically. Uh, for a while it was magnetism, that thoughts must exert a magnetic force uh, and that draws things to you. As we know, however, our heads are not attracted to refrigerators. And, you know, there's no, the magnetic force that is so tiny that is exerted. By that. Now they talk about quantum physics. I love that. You know, at quantum physics, for some reason, are an ex have become an excuse to mock all of science. See, there's nothing real, nothing true. And it, whatever you think, that's how the world is. So if you think positively, you remake the world positively according to this uh, pseudoscientific explanation. But anyway, what's wrong with this? Why not delude yourself into thinking, you know, everything's fine and that you can change the world with your thoughts? And I have two problems with it. Um, one, I'll, I'll be hard line about this. I think delusion is always a mistake. Uh, it, there is, there's no safe delusions. Uh, although one of the messages of positive psychology in the United States is, yeah, it's good to have some positive delusions about yourself. Um, and the, you know, the, I think the biggest evidence to that is something that came along while I was actually working on the book, which is the financial meltdown of 07. Now, a lot of things went into that, uh, you know, like the extreme class inequalities of the United States and, well, your country too. Uh, you know, greed and uh, uh, an economy is based increasingly on finance rather than manufacturing or anything. But certainly one element was the grip of positive thinking in the corporate world and particularly in the financial um, sector. I mean, people who tried to raise problems uh, in the middle of the last decade, uh, it's hard to call it the last decade already, but anyway, you know, would be shut up or fired. You couldn't be inside Countrywide Mortgage Company, uh, which was the, the one that it's almost single-handedly, you know, set off the whole collapse in the US, and say, I'm worried about our subprime mortgage exposure, or you'd be out. You couldn't say that. And I got to interview um, some Wall Street guys, very successful. Wall Street guys, um, um, they, they said, this is just how it is. You can't, you know, people who tried, let's say, within Lehman Brothers, to point out that, that the, the housing prices could not rise forever were fired. You know, so it was this willful ignorance. Nobody could think bad thoughts, nothing bad, and if you didn't, nothing bad would happen. And I think the other thing that I find very, very disturbing about it is, I, think, I just think it's cruel. I mean, it's, ta it's cruel to take people who are having great difficulties in their lives and tell them that it's all in their head and they only have to change their attitude. Uh, and I, you know, my favorite example of this um, moral callousness is um, from the author of The Secret. That was a bestseller here too, admit it. 
uh, the book on how you can have anything you want, attract anything to yourself by thinking. And she was asked um, about the tsunami of 06 and how, you know, how could this happen? You know, and she, she said, and kind of paraphrasing it, those people, the victims of it, must have been sending out tsunami-like vibrations into the universe to attract that to themselves, because nothing happens to us that we don't attract. And I, I, I think that's beyond amorality. I, I don't even know where to locate uh, that. Anyway, to just finish up, I'm, I'm not advocating gloom and pessimism or negativity or depression. Those can also be delusional. I mean, you can go around you know, making up a story to yourself that everything you undertake is going to fail. Uh, and that's, there's no reason to think that. I, my very radical suggestion is realism. Just trying to figure out what is actually happening in the world and seeing what we can do about those parts of it that are threatening or hurtful. So I'm just going to ask two or three questions, and then we'll um, and, and then we'll open up. Um, uh, one of the things I found really interesting in the book was your um, uh, account of where you thought this, the origins of this kind of positive thinking movement lay, and in particular your description of the uh, rejection of Calvinist thought in 19th century America. That in a sense Calvinism, which made people sick with misery, because if they had a bad thought, it meant they were going to hell. Um, uh, that uh, the religious movement sprang up in response to the misery that that had been called, that were caused by that. And in a sense, that's the origin of it. And then it's been used by people who run corporations or by a variety of other, but by people in power, it's used as a useful tool of control. Is that a fair account of yeah, where, this, where, this, where this comes from? Yeah, there was a, what has been called an epidemic of invalidism among middle-class people, but especially women in the United States in the 19th century which you could argue had a tremendous amount to do with the Calvinist religion. It said, we're all wretched sinners, we're all, or 99.9% .9 of us are, we're all doomed to eternal torment. And the fascinating individuals, uh, self-educated people, who started the positive thinking movement and said, nah, it's not that bad. You know, God doesn't hate you. Uh, get up out of bed, you, could, you know, you have more control over your life than you thought. Um, you know, all, that's, Fine, and it worked. It did, it did actually cure certain kinds of very psychosomatic illnesses. I, I would call them psychosomatic. I hope that's not being totally unfair. People didn't even have aspirin at that time. But um, it, it did nothing for diseases like diphtheria or uh, TB or cholera, which were you know, the big killers of, of the time. Uh, then this sort of became a little movement people who had this superior insight that we could control the universe with our thoughts. And let me share something with you. I'm a bit of an up and down kind of person. Um, and, and so uh, it's kind of, I know it's true for me when you say, let's look at the world as it's real, that there is no kind of steady state real world for me. There's a world which is the world I see when I'm in a good mood, and there's a world which is the world I see when I'm in a bad mood. There is no kind of real world outside my feelings about that world. So I'm quite interested in what this, how it is, as it were, you suggest that there's a real world that we can see devoid from any, no. uh, any emotions. And given that we always see the world through an emotional prism, isn't it broadly speaking better to see it through a positive you, prism? you don't think that everybody else in this room is a figment of your imagination. No, I don't no. think that. Okay, okay, good, all right. Uh, then we can st <laughs> continue. No, I, th I think that's a very good question. I, I used to throw that at my parents all the time when I was growing up. Don't talk to me about realism. What's your reality, you know? And, but there, is, there are processes by which we try to approach what is happening. Like, it's, you know, suppose it was the, the mortgage crisis in the United States, where you might say, well, no, let's look at the actual data. Let's look at the information. Let's not bury it or depend on some kind of account, you know, accounting wizardry, wizardry which will hide all our problems. I, my background is in science, and I think, you know, there, there's not one fixed truth or reality, but we're, we close in on something. And we, then we think, oh, this is as good as we can understand for now, 
you know, until we get better information, but try to act on that. One of the people um, that you give a particularly hard time to in the book, and it's, you know, it's a very um, uh, amusing kind of section of the book, is Martin Seligman, the uh, founding father of positive psychology, who you don't seem to get on with terribly well, from what I can gather. Um, uh, uh, um, that leads me to kind of feel that, that as, as well as kind of positive thinking, you're also kind of suspicious of the idea that, that, that happiness is the goal for human beings, that in a sense, as long, you know, that a world in which we're all happy, however we get happiness, whether it's by dropping pills or by thinking positively, that actually human, that life's about something more than the pursuit of a kind of blandly defined happiness. Is that taking no, it too far? No, no, I'm all for happiness. For, I don't know exactly what it means. You know, I think it's a very, very fuzzy concept. I mean, if you ask me, or I'm going to ask you right now, are you happy? We would have to think, well, maybe I was four hours ago, but then you know, I got some bad news, and I'm not, you know, it, it's really uh, a tricky question. And when, there's a, a fascinating study, um, I hope I can describe this right, where the um, subjects were asked about how, ha you know, it was a survey, happiness survey. Some of the subjects were arbitrarily told, asked by the researcher to go photocopy something before they took the survey. And for a random, some certain number of those people, there was a coin uh, on the photocopying machine, like a dime. It turns out the people who found the dime were all happier than the other people. Now, I, so I think this is not a useful concept. I'd much rather talk, if we're going to talk about good feelings, I'd rather talk about joy or even bliss or something like that, you know, which is maybe brief and intense. But way too much, when, you know, when Seligman and those people talk about happiness, and I, I've taken his ha the happiness test, the Seligman happiness, authentic happiness test. I took it, yeah. How did you do? Well, you know, I think I could have done a lot better. <laughs> um, and what, what tripped me up more than, I mean, the, well, there were two things that tripped me up. One was um, the, the thing about, you know, rate yourself. I am of all the way from I am extremely proud of myself to I am ashamed of myself with gradations in between. Uh, I'm, come on. I have no idea how to answer that. You know, pride is a sin. And I'm, I'm not, you know, I just don't, I can't relate to that question. The other was about optimism. Are you generally optimistic? I didn't know how to answer. If I talk about, you know, my own life day by day, yeah, I guess. But if I talk about the human condition, yeah, not so good, you know. Uh, so I told Martin Seligman, as I said, I'm, I, I felt my score was a lot, did not reflect my actual experience or, or emotional tone. He said, <laughs> he said, you need optimism training. You can increase your optimism and your productivity as a writer would soar. And I, I had no idea what to say. First of all, you can't be that much more productive than I am because that's how I earn my living. But secondly, if I were that optimistic, I'd have nothing to write about. You know? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm for half. As I said, joy, you know, dancing in the streets, festivities, things like that. And it, I think it's almost because we have so little of that in our cultures that we focus on this nebulous concept of happiness, a vague contentment with the status quo. So you would, I, I would assume, this is my final question, warning, oh, get ready, get ready, um, is uh, you would presumably be kind of slightly suspicious of developments which people sometimes characterize as the emergence of the therapeutic state, which is the idea of government teaching things like emotional well-being in schools and a variety of sort of interventions in people's lives which are, which many of them based upon positive psychology. They're based upon the notion that you can give people techniques which enable them to live more contentedly. They don't actually suffer from mental illness. They simply suffer from an inability to, to feel as positively or to be as positive as they should be. Yes, I'm very suspic suspicious of, of those sorts of things. Um, the, the positive psychology project in Britain is to uh, get optimism training into other schools. Um, I, you know, what would that mean? Um, I, the, they have been quite successful in the United States in getting um, courses on positive psychology in the universities. In 2006, the most popular undergraduate course at Harvard 
was positive psychology, where the students would do things like write um, journals about what things made them happy, or write gratitude letters, um, to, you know, which didn't, didn't have to be sent. And they actually got course credit for this. You know, you don't, I do not send my children to universities to learn to be positive thinkers, but to be, learn to be critical thinkers. So I think it's really pernicious, uh, th that kind of I intervention. Okay, great. Well, I, I didn't think it would take long to get some hands up, so, uh, yep, uh, and then we'll take uh, you, and then we'll take the arm that's over there. Okay, great. Tell us who you are, and be short and sharp and to the point. Hi, Dave Straker, Changing Minds. Um, what? So it, it seems that, that uh, positive thinking is okay, it's just the false positive that's wrong, that, um, that appearing to be positive when you're actually inside, perhaps you're not. Right, yeah. So, but falsehood seems to be very much a social thing. You know, we, we are, there are social rules about, you know, the saving face and then there's group think and risky shift and all those mm -hmm. other things. It seems like it's a natural state, you know, a natural way of being, being false. So how do you change being false to being truthful? What we'll do is take three at a time. That, is that right? Yeah, that's a lot. Sure. Uh, do you want oh, to pass oh, it back? Pause well, it back, pause well, it back. Okay, you might have to remind me with some of the more than that. I wanted to ask a question about... Tell us uh, your name. Oh, my name is Neha. Neha. Um, about positive thinking. Uh, I know, obviously, you're, you're not against positive thinking, but you're also saying it's better to be a realist. So trying to make an analogy to a real-life situation. Say you've got two mothers, and one's, both of them are exactly genetically the same, and they have a child who's doing drugs, let's say, and one decides to be a realist and address the problems um, and confront their child and get quite depressed about it. And the other one decides to be positive and ignore the problem, but it keeps them kind of in that ignorance is bliss state because they're not perhaps mm -hmm. dealing with it. And they go on like that and think it's just a phase. Mm -hmm. And it does turn out to be a phase and it's all fine. Um, out of mother A and B, which would be um, the better state to be in your opinion, and my second question, which is related but not the same, is would you say that, from your understanding of depression as an illness, that less intelligent people are less like, or not less intelligent, but less analytical people? Less, less what people? Less, in, less analytical less people. Less analytical people. We don't, know, we don't have less intelligent people here. Yes, yeah, sorry, that's what it's I, a, I didn't, a, that, that wasn't even a Freudian yeah. slip, I just didn't mean to say that. Um, less analytical people are less likely to suffer from depression because they're not even fighting to try and think positively. They just happen to be not so absorbed. They tend to just think in a very now, live for now. They don't even get onto the tier of positive mm -hmm. and negative thinking. They're just mm -hmm. dealing with now. Um, okay. That was my question. Wow. Uh, yep, and then over here. I have a much briefer question. Uh, there have been books, lots of things written, which claim to show that people, two people with virtually identical diseases, uh, if one has a much more, uh, sorry, yeah. My name is Stanley Grossman, by the way. Somebody uh, who has a more positive attitude is statistically more likely to have uh, a better outcome from the disease. Uh, do you think that's all nonsense, or do you give credit, credence to the effect of uh, positivism on improving one's health in dire circumstances. Okay, so I think you yeah. made, made that point. But go, but, but no, go. I'll start with that because that's um, easier. It's, I, it's, it's, first, I want to say it's very muddled, uh, the whole field. And um, Seligman, uh, since writing this book came out, has accused me of, quote, cherry picking. I went very far not to even push some of the studies that would refute positive psychology because I'm not sure about them either scientifically. I mean, for example, in terms of longevity, you can find there are plenty of things saying that more positive people, whatever that may mean, and it may be simply a performance, as you were suggesting, uh, live longer. There are other studies that find that more cantankerous people live longer. So, you know, I, I just, I would just throw up my hands at that. But the studies that have been done now on cancer uh, for both breast, lung, and neck and throat cancer, uh, show that people who are in some kind of therapeutic intervention or a support group have, and, and hence are likely, one assumes, to be in a more positive frame of mind or more mentally balanced or something. 
there's no effect on, on their survival rates from cancer whatsoever. So that was all nonsense. Uh, you know, I, I, the, some of the stuff on cardiac disease is a little more, a little more in favor of a positive outlook, but I don't know how much of that is just because stress and anxiety and anger are themselves um, risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Don't know. I mean, I'm open to hearing more on that. Um, are, are, are people who think about think about themselves a lot more likely to be depressed? I don't know the answer to that. Interesting. Oh, people who are analytic more depressed? I don't know. Um, I, the whole subject of depression is kind of fascinating. I wrote about that in Dancing in the Streets because um, you know, England in particular, as well as many other countries, experienced an epidemic of melancholy in the 17th century. Uh, well, late 17th century, which I connected in my book to the suppression of so many traditional festivities, um, you know, with, in, 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 under the Puritan regime. And I, it, it's just, uh, you'd have to, we're not selling that book, are we? I'd like to push that book a little bit. Anyway, um, but uh, no, I don't, th I don't think there's uh, any known connection. The idea of, for a long time was that smarter people somehow are more likely to get mentally ill or likely to become neurotic. And that's not how it works out. You know, I mean, there, if anything, the, uh, you know, the class correlation, which has nothing to do with intelligence, but anyway, uh, the class correlation is, is more extreme mental illness among those people who are most hard pressed. So we don't, I don't think we know anything about uh, analytic capabilities. And the point about isn't pretending to be positive just kind of hardwired into us? We, you know, we, that kind of presentation of ourselves is not that, you know, a natural thing oh, for us hardwired. to do? No, I, I don't um, think so at all. I think uh, if, I would make a case that we are hardwired to be vigilant. I mean, yes, we have many other capabilities, you know, to be jolly, to be, experience camaraderie, solidarity, all of those great things. But we're also we are hardwired to be vigilant and on guard. That's how our very distant ancestors survived. Uh, not by saying, oh, it's, everything's probably OK. Don't worry about the motion in the tall grass over there. The people who survived said, move. It's a leopard. You know, Let's go. Um, that, that's, I think, the, the hardwired part. Then I just want to touch on a child raising issue. I don't know if I fully understood the A and B cases of the mothers. One is just gets too depressed to confront the teenager who's probably using drugs, and the other one just blocks it out. I think there may be C and D options, is what my thoughts. C and D. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, if, so even if happiness makes no difference to the outcome, isn't it better to, tra as my grandmother used to say, isn't it better to travel hopefully than to arrive? <laughs> well, it's always better to try. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. Well, no, but yeah, the, the point is, it doesn't matter whether it's related to outcomes or not. Right. I mean, okay, Maybe you're you may right. Not live, I, you may not live a day longer if you've got a positive attitude to your cancer, but you know, you'll enjoy. You might enjoy the last few months. No, of, you, you, you won't necessarily enjoy it more. Right. Not if you have suffering from. You know, as some not, oncology nurses are saying now, it's a burden to put on somebody, this effort to be positive. And maybe one reason we put it on very ill people is that we don't want to hear their complaints. It's too hard to be around that. So you just you know, shut up you know, and put on a smiley face. And I, do, I want to say one thing about parenting, though. And I don't know if this is a direct answer to your question, but it's something that fascinated me. You know, the positive psychologists um, have shown all kinds of correlations between happiness and many things you would expect 
having more money, uh, being married, um, being religious, I don't quite get that one, but anyway, there's a whole lot of, they find all these correlations. Correlation does not mean causation, except for being a parent. Oh, yeah. Being a parent is a setback <laughs> in terms of your happiness. And, and, it, and this is going back to that vigilance part. I mean, I've uh, been a, a mother, now I'm a, a grandmother playing a big role in the upbringing of my two granddaughters. When you've got toddlers and they're in the other room and they're quiet, for a suspicious amount of time, like 10 minutes, you do not assume that they're just in there studying baby Einstein. <laughs> you have to assume they're putting a fork into an electrical outlet. <laughs> I mean, this is how we reproduce our genomes. So we, it, it, you, you know, it, and so it, it, <coughs> parents turn out to be less happy, uh, which would make, make, make wonder about the whole hardwired explanation. Uh, at all, you know, about what we're hard aware to be. I remember someone once summed up all the happiness research to me in the line that to be happy for a year, get a partner, to be happy for 10 years, get a dog, and to be happy forever, get a garden. I think that is the garden. basic <laughs> summary of the, uh, um, of the evidence. Uh, and children don't, as you say, enter Can I just ask about politicians? Um, because there is a lot of work, uh, I think of Drew Weston's work, about, um, the, the, about the politicians who uh, make us feel good, who seem positive, who seem optimistic, are much more popular mm -hmm. than politicians who make us feel miserable and down and suicidal. Um, uh, um, uh, now, we, as you know, have a prime minister who, who isn't very good at making people feel kind of buoyant. Uh, and when we have a leader of opposition who's got his photograph everywhere, presumably because people think his face makes us all feel happy. So, uh, in politics, isn't kind of appealing to people's happiness clearly a kind of a, 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 a proven uh, oh, virtue? Yeah, yeah um, the, in, in the U.S. case, Ronald Reagan, who was the most optimistic president, you know, that anybody had seen up to that point, and then uh, George W. Bush. Uh, George W. Bush was a cheerleader in college. Not an athlete, but a cheerleader. And I think he construed the presidency as a continuation of that role. <laughs> I, he, I, he just did not, he, he is one of those people who closed himself in a bubble of positive feeling. Uh, Condoleezza Rice uh, said uh, way too late uh, that she had had doubts about the invasion of Iraq, but she didn't uh, dare express them because uh, the president hated to be around, quote, pessimists. See the equation of pessimism with doubt. You know, um, so nobody, nobody raised any questions about that war within the hearing of the president. Or those that did, like the general who suggested that we were only putting uh, half as many troops on the ground as, as would be needed to uh, accomplish whatever we were trying to accomplish, uh, he was pushed out of the way. He lost his, his job, essentially. So, but, but Barack Obama's message was very upbeat as well. It was very kind of, you know, change, we can change. It wasn't a kind of, you know, the human condition is basically tragic. Um, no. You know, no, I'll do what gonna, I can to ameliorate your elected. misery, you know. I mean, I think it would be <laughs> almost easier to be elected as an out atheist than to be elected as a pessimistic president in the United States. Well, you had Tony Blair, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah he, absolutely. He, yeah. he was he certainly. <laughs> and he was quite successful. But Obama, election, Obama yeah, all right. He ran on his hope theme, which irritated me. <laughs> I don't really care what a politician hopes. I only am interested in what he or she plans or thinks. Um, but you know, he he continually gives us a sense, and his inaugural address was a good example. He's a person who's capable of thinking. And he's a person of capable of taking in information from different sides, um, you know, and, and arriving at a decision, even if I don't, I often tend to not agree with him. But um. Barbara, thank you. I know you're going on to do Newsnight later on. Uh, you might be interviewed by Jeremy Paxson, who hasn't smiled since 1984, so uh, <laughs> you'll have a lot in common with, uh, with him. Do go out and do buy this fantastic book. It's, uh, it, it's very, I mean, it's, it's, it's brilliant, it's powerful, it's also very funny at parts. Uh, and finally, could I ask you to join me in thanking Barbara Einreich. <laughs>